Welcome to Concepts of Programming Languages. My name is Dr. Califf, and I would like to introduce you to the concept of BNF, or bacchus nauer form grammars. First of all, I want to talk just a little bit about why on earth we care about a grammar. So a grammar is basically a way to express the structure of a language formally. We're going to focus primarily on programming languages, though we also can use grammars to represent natural languages like English, Spanish, Japanese, etc. And I am going to take a few examples from English because I assume since you're listening to this in English, you understand a little bit about how the English language works. As we think about programming languages, a key thing that grammars do is they help the person creating the language clarify and communicate the structure of the language to others. So clarify for themselves and communicate it to others. The grammar for a language can also help us understand it as we're learning or trying to more deeply understand a language. It can be useful to look at the grammar for the language to see how it's supposed to work. So we know the rules. Finally, if we're tasked with implementing a compiler or an interpreter for a language, the grammar is a key piece of that. And often we have a piece of the compiler or the interpreter that looks almost exactly like a grammar for the language. Before we get into actually looking at what bacchus nauer form grammars look like, I want to go over a little bit of vocabulary because there are some things that we need to understand, some terminology that we need to be clear on for grammars. First of all, syntax. So the syntax of a language, whether a natural language or a programming language, is simply the structure of the language. So let me give you a few English examples to help you get at this idea. So here I have a simple sentence, the girl ate the pasta. This is a correct sentence with correct structure. Then I have something with the same words in it, but girl pasta the ate the is not syntactically correct. There is no structure of English that allows that to be a sentence. We can also see the effects of syntax in this next one, which uses the same words again, the pasta ate the girl. Same words, slightly different structure. Semantics is another aspect of language, which is really about the meaning of the language. We're not going to talk a whole lot about semantics in this video, but I do want you to have some understanding of what it is and sort of see how it's going to connect to our syntax. So we have wrong syntax in a programming language, at least. We have no meaning. So if your syntax is wrong, the compiler or interpreter can't do anything with what you've written and no meaning will result. If the syntax is wrong enough, that's also true of natural language. So certainly our second example on the previous slide had no meaning. In a natural language, correct syntax can sometimes result in something meaningless. So a standard example of that is colorless green ideas sleep furiously. That's syntactically completely correct. Perfectly good English sentence in terms of its structure has no meaning. One of the things that we try very hard to do is to make sure this can't happen in a program that if we have a syntactically correct sentence, there is a meaning that the computer can execute. One thing I want you to be very aware of, and one thing that we will focus on in the next video, is that syntax impacts semantics. So if we think about the girl and the pasta, how the syntax was done, whether the girl was the subject of the sentence or the object of the sentence, made a huge difference to the meaning of the sentence. And that's going to be true sometimes for our programming languages and their grammars as well. Another thing we need to understand is what terminals or terminal symbols are in a language. So these are the base tokens of the language. For a programming language, that might be keywords, operators, and other symbols, so plus, minus, your asterisk for times, parentheses, curly braces, and so on. And then the characters that can be used in identifiers, in numbers, or other program elements. These are the things that make up the actual program we're going to read. 
non-terminals or non-terminal symbols are used to represent pieces of the structure. For a grammar of English, these would include things like noun, verb, noun phrase, verb phrase, sentence. For a programming language, they might include things like statement or condition or subroutine. They basically identify pieces of the syntax that it makes sense to work with. But notice they don't appear in the actual program. These are labels for parts of the program that make sense as part of the structure. And then finally, we have productions or production rules. These are the rules that make up the grammar, the things that connect our non-terminals and our terminals to define what the language looks like. So each rule is going to translate a non-terminal to a sequence of one or more non-terminals or terminals. So some examples of that, a sentence might be a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. And in fact, in English usually is. A verb phrase is typically a verb or a verb followed by a noun phrase. Then a verb would be one of a list of words, things like saw, liked, ate, visited, loved, and so on. Now that we have an idea of what goes into a grammar and what we're talking about, I want to talk a little bit about expressing a grammar. There are lots of ways to do this. Three key ways are used for programming. Today we're going to focus on Bacchus Nauer form, or BNF, which is the simplest of our approaches in many ways. It was created by John Bacchus, who also designed Fortran, and Peter Nauer. So Bacchus Nauer simply are the two people who created it. There are two other major forms that get used for programming languages. Extended Bacchus Nauer form, or EBNF, which adds some other elements to the Bacchus Nauer form in order to allow it to be more compact, but a little bit more complex. And then syntax diagrams, which are really graphs of the syntax of a language. This can be easier to understand in some ways than BNF or EBNF, but it tends to be less compact and it is much harder to turn into a program or to work with programmatically. So the elements of BNF. First of all, we need terminals. Those are simply going to be written out. So while we need a while, that keyword, we're just going to write while. Non-terminals are going to be enclosed in angle brackets so that we can distinguish them from the terminals. Then productions are going to be in the form some non-terminal, then colon colon equals, and then some sequence of terminals or non-terminals. Worth noting that sometimes that colon colon equals symbol is written a little bit differently. You might see it with just one colon. You might see it with a colon followed by a hyphen or dash. This, however, is the most common version of the syntax. Here's an example. Sentence goes to noun phrase followed by verb phrase, where noun phrase and verb phrase are also non-terminals. The only other thing we have to worry about in terms of what the elements of BNF are is that we can use the pipe symbol or the vertical bar to represent or. And that's all there is to it. So BNF is very, very simple in terms of its structure. So I have a couple of examples I'm going to go through here. First of all, a fairly simple example where I'm just trying to interpret a number, see if it's a valid number. So I might have digit and then it's zero or one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine. Then I might represent an integer as being a digit because it could be just one digit or a digit followed by an integer, which will consist of one or more digits. Grammars in general tend to be inherently recursive. This is true of our natural language grammars as well as our programming language grammars. Then finally, I have here floating point goes to integer dot integer. Of course, when we think about the semantics of that, that may not make sense to us, but that will parse correctly for a floating point number in this form. 
Here I have a somewhat more complex, though certainly incomplete, example. This might be a fragment of a grammar for a C-based language like C or Java or C++, C Sharp, etc. So I have statement, and I've provided four of the possible translations of statement. There are, of course, many more in all of those languages. An if statement, it could be a while statement, or it could be an assignment, or it could be a block. An assignment typically does look something like variable, though there are some other options besides variable, of course. And then the equal symbol, and then some sort of expression. An if statement can be an if, open parenthesis, condition, close parenthesis, and a statement. Or it might be if, open parenthesis, condition, close parenthesis, statement, else, statement. A while statement, of course, would be a while, open parenthesis, condition, close parenthesis, statement. A block would be open curly braces, a statement sequence, close curly braces, where a statement sequence is going to be a single statement or a statement followed by a statement sequence. So this would be a fragment of the grammar for one of those C-based languages. Now, of course, here I haven't gotten down to the level of terminals very much. I do have the equal sign and the parentheses and the curly braces, um, as well as the if and while keywords. But I haven't really addressed the identifiers and so forth. And part of that was simply didn't have a lot of space. But another reason is that we often don't want to try to deal with those at the same time. We have both lexical and phrase structure. So by lexical structure, we mean the structure of the valid tokens in a language, things like numbers and identifiers. By phrase structure, we mean the larger structure of sentences and programs, the kind of structure that the second example I showed you was about, whereas the first example was about lexical structure. In general, when we're dealing with programming languages, and actually natural languages as well. We tend to use separate grammars to handle lexical structure versus phrase structure, because when we try to combine them, things can get very complex and ugly. And in fact, when we create compilers or interpreters for languages, those typically also usually handle what they call lexical analysis separately from going through the structure of the language and handling the phrase structure. So typically we do lexical analysis first, identify all these tokens and whether they're identifiers or numbers or keywords and so on, and then go through and apply the rules of a phrase structure for the language. Before we end this video, I do want to talk to you just a second about parse trees and show you what those are about. The idea of a parse tree is that it's a way to demonstrate how a fragment of a language is structured given a grammar. So here I've got the parse tree for the first example grammar that I showed as applied to the number 93.4. That's a floating point, so it's going to consist of an integer, the string of digits, followed by a period, followed by another integer, string of digits. And the integer, in the first case, will consist of a digit followed by an integer. So we've got two numbers there. The digit will get translated into the 9 for 93.4. The second integer will be just a single digit. will get translated into the 3. Of course, the point we picked up with the overall structure at the beginning. And the last part of the floating point integer is just a single digit which is, of course, 4. So this shows us how that grammar structures that particular number. This will be very useful to us as we go on in the next video to start talking about semantics and ambiguity. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time when we will be talking about parse trees some more and uh, looking at how the syntax of a language relates to the semantics of the language and what can be ambiguous and what we do about ambiguity in programming languages.